as we take our Bibles and read Scripture today, we will be reading out of Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 19. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the, first, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You may be seated. Turn your song to us now <clears throat> to number 444, 444. <laughs> notice if you're watching the slides there was a slide there concerning a building fund and uh, we are trying to raise funds to replace the deteriorating siding and you might look at the auditorium and say well that's brick and I've mentioned it numerous times this isn't really brick on this end it's kind of a brick facing and it's falling off that end is brick so we are going to have to repair replace actually and uh, we have a goal of of uh, raising $30,000. 
So some money has come in, and maybe uh, beginning of next month, we'll be able to share with you how much money has come in. And um, so just ask the Lord what he'd have you to do. Help us with that uh, goal, and just pray what God would have you to do. We, want, we, we, we enjoy the use of this building, and we want to keep being able to do so. And uh, it's only going, it's something that is going to, going to get, only going to get worse. And when it begins to get worse, it's going to get worse faster as it gets worse because it's kind of like a domino effect. Uh, and then also Sunday, next Sunday, October 27th is a missionary emphasis potluck Sunday, Evergreen Manor service at two o'clock and then no evening service next Sunday. And then Monday, October 28th is uh, the eight week ladies Bible study will continue or, or resume. And that's on Monday nights at 6.30. If you have any questions about that, you could see Denise. They're about halfway through at this point, though. And then we also still need your help. We need your help in a couple of areas uh, for the trunk or treat. We need more trunks. So if you can come and help uh, distribute candy, that would be wonderful. And that's really all we're going to do. We're going to have trunks out here open, and we're going to distribute candy to children. We're going to invite a lot of children. I'll send out some invitations. I put some invitations back on the table in the foyer if you'd like to give some out. Uh, I actually ran out of postcard material, so some are on like a red paper. And so if you'd like to give those out, we'll be sending out some invitations this week. And we'll also use that as an opportunity, which is our primary goal, to give out the gospel in the process and reach out into our community. So really be praying about that in the meantime as well. And if you could donate some candy, we have some back there on the table, that would be great too. And pray that that would be a great opportunity to get to know some of the people in our community and have an opportunity to share with them the Lord Jesus Christ. And then also there's some information in the bulletin about Morris Vice Funeral. For those of you who don't know, uh, number one, uh, Morris... Pastor Morris Weiss pastored uh, what was Fundamental Baptist Church, which now Fellowship Baptist Church, many years ago uh, for probably over 20 years. And uh, he passed away. He was 95 years old. He passed away September 30th. And the family is going to have a memorial service at Bachman Hubble on Saturday, October 26th. And the funeral time is, tw is uh, excuse me, the visitation is from 12 to 1 funeral service at 1 o'clock, and then we're going to be having a meal for the family here in the fellowship hall. The, the food for the meal is being provided. The family is bringing that in or catering that in, but we're asking the church, is that clipboard around there, Wesley? There's a clipboard in the back. Uh, Wes, why don't you bring that up and give it to us. So we'll start it on this side and see if we can get that passed around. Uh, we need desserts. For that funeral meal. So if you could provide a dessert, that would be uh, wonderful. And again, the meal will be approximately, just, just start it back there around where Edith is. That would be great. We'll start it there and it'll work its way around. So um, anyway, you need to get those desserts in, you know, either Saturday morning or uh, maybe Friday evening. So if you have any problems with that, you could see me about that. So I think that's all that I have in the way of announcements, and now I'd like you, again, to open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 2, John chapter 2, if you're not there already, and I have been, most of the time, putting my outlines in the bulletin, and I didn't do that this morning, because I really don't have an outline. It's a little different for me. I, it would be more or less a list, I guess. Uh, but I'm working towards a goal here with the message this morning. And I've mentioned over the past several weeks, on Wednesday nights, we've been in Colossians. And I have been getting such a wonderful blessing myself out of the study of the book of Colossians. And I hope that the folks that are there on Wednesday nights are getting a blessing from it as well. But it has been a tremendous blessing from you. So I've, I've for the past... I, oh, well, week or so, I guess, last week and this week at least, uh, I've gotten some messages that came from that study in the book of Colossians. And tonight we're going to start here, or this morning, excuse me, we're going to start here in John chapter 2 and look at a couple other places in the book of John and then work our way to the book of Colossians. Let's pray first. God, we're so thankful for your blessings to us. I pray, God, that you would uh, help us today to see just remove any blinders from our eyes, any scales from our eyes that are hindering us from seeing uh, 
uh, the true greatness and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, help us to see him uh, in his glory as it is revealed to us here in Scripture and as he truly is. God, help us to see that. And God, I pray if there's someone here as well that might not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that they might see that Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for their sin and his resurrection is their only hope of eternal life, placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your free gift of salvation through him. Work in our hearts. Help us as Christians, God, to see Jesus today and in all his glory. And Lord, that we might have a greater desire uh, to live for him, to please him, to proclaim him in our families, in our homes, in our churches, and in our jobs, in our community. God, I pray that you be glorified today. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you looked in the bulletin and saw the title and kind of the confusing text someone asked me, we're going to have all of John chapter 1 through 4. That's going to be a long message if we're going to go through all those chapters, but we're not going to do that. But I just felt it would be easier than trying to give you all the different passages we're going to look at. And then the, the scripture reading and text is really from Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 through 19. And the title of the message is The Manifested Glory of Jesus Christ. The Manifested Glory of Jesus Christ. Let's look at John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, it says, In the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins of peace. These are some pretty large pots. Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And we'll stop right there just for a moment. But if you were invited to a wedding, and I've of course, probably been at quite a few weddings, and I'm sure many of you have been at quite a few weddings, and you may have gotten an invitation to a wedding that said something along the lines of ice cream and dessert, or ice cream and cake will be served following the wedding ceremony. And maybe there was a little note of disappointment in your heart. In fact, if you came to my wife and my wedding, that's sort of what we had. Ended up being a lot more food than that, but we didn't have a lot of money uh, to have a big, huge wedding reception. And a lot of people like that. And I kind of say, when I see something like that, where they're only serving, you know, maybe cupcakes and ice cream after the wedding, I say to myself, you know, it's really no use spending a huge amount of money and going into debt for a wedding. You know, I'll get something to eat afterwards, or I'll go get something to eat before. No big deal. But can you imagine if you were invited to a wedding, and that's what it said on the invitation, and you got to the wedding, and you walk in, and there's this huge spread of food. I mean, they hired a chef from New York City, and this chef just prepared for everyone the best cut of steak you could possibly have. And it was a seven-course meal, and they, they hired a, a chef from Paris to come in and make all the desserts. And, man, you would be in all of this. Well, you weren't expecting this. This is unusual. And if that happened, you would probably leave that wedding and tell other people about it. You're not going to believe this wedding. They said we were going to have cupcakes and ice cream, and then we arrive, and they, they hired this one of the greatest known chefs to come and prepare this unbelievable meal and these these unbelievable desserts and this seven-course meal. And man, I was just in awe. And you might even want to know the story. You might want to say to maybe the, the parents, what, what went on there? I mean, what happened between the time you sent those invitations out and the time that you had the wedding? Huh, something unusual happening. Something happened that you weren't expecting. And that's sort of what happened at this wedding. This was not how you were supposed to do it. This was out of the norm. You were supposed to serve the good wine at the beginning of the wedding feast. 
and save the less good wine for towards the end. But yet that's not how it happened here. The good wine came toward the end of, and these wedding feasts weren't just kind of like our wedding receptions. Sometimes they lasted for days because you can imagine people traveled for miles and miles and miles around and they didn't jump on an airplane or they didn't jump on a bus or jump in a car. Their mode of travel is a little more primitive. And they're questioning, what's going on here? What happened? This is really unusual. And I would imagine that it maybe became the talk of the town. I kind of believe what happened to this wedding. And it might not seem like a big deal to us, but it was a big enough deal that this one guy said, what in the world is going on here? Look into this. Find out what's going on. But what's the story? What is the key to understanding this? What really went on? And I think the key to understanding it is found in the verse we didn't read yet, and that's verse 11. Look at verse 11 with me of John chapter 2. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. He manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So We'll see this really throughout the book of John. We're not going to go through the book of John, but if you were to study the book of John, really the Gospels, you would see this, and even up into the epistles, and even on into the book of Revelation. You see a miracle which points to the manifested glory of Jesus Christ, which leads to people believing on Jesus Christ. We really kind of saw that this morning as we were looking in Sunday school with those guys walking on the road to Emmaus. They were kind of confused about Jesus Christ. What happened? And then Jesus comes up alongside them. They don't know it's Jesus. And he begins to talk to them from the scriptures about himself, still not knowing who he is. And then finally he reveals himself. And they say, did not our hearts burn within us? The manifested glory of Jesus Christ was revealed to them. I want you to jump back now to John chapter 1. Because we see here... An example, the first miracle, we see an example here of what John records. And John is recording material. Well, I'll get to this point in a minute. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But John is recording material, recording events, recording significant events in the life of Jesus that support his theses. He set out and said, this is what I'm going to do. And here is how I'm going to support it. So we've just read the support material. Let's go back and read John's theses. Let's go back to chapter 1. Look at chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now we know, as we read down through chapter 1, who he's talking about when he talks about the Word. If you look at verse 14, it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And what does it say there? And we beheld his glory. He's talking about Jesus Christ. But John starts out and says, the word, Jesus, was in the beginning. From the beginning of time. And the word was with God. And then it says, the word was God. In eternity. For eternity. So this is John's thesis. Jesus is God. Let's read on. The same was at the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was the life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness. The glory of who Jesus is comes and bursts into darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. So what does John set out to do as in, the, in the book of John? He sets out to reveal the glory of Jesus as it unfolded before his apostles, as it unfolded, as it manifested, as it was revealed during the life of Christ, as John and the other apostles spent that time with Jesus. And that's why we have that example of Jesus' first miracle in turning the water into into wine. It was for the purpose, not of just making this amazing event that people could go around talking about and say, you're not going to believe what happened this wedding, although that's what happened but for the purpose of manifesting the glory of Jesus Christ so that those to whom that glory was revealed, those, however big or small that window into that glory they got to see, that it might be revealed to them so that they might do what? That they might believe on him. That they might believe on him. Let's go to now to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And what I want you to see here in John chapter 4 is kind of a crash that happens. And the crash that happens, the collision that happens, results in the manifested glory of Jesus Christ. And then the manifested glory of Jesus Christ results in what? People believing. So let's look at John chapter 4, beginning with verse 46. John 4 and verse 46. So Jesus came into Canaan of Galilee, where he made water to wine. So it's significant. He's back in the same place where he made the water to wine. So this guy probably heard about that, probably heard about other miracles, heard about Jesus. Verse 46, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die, or my child's going to die if you don't. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoken, had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed and his whole house. This again is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So why did this nobleman come to Jesus? First of all, he's kind of an unlikely person to come to Jesus. He's a man of great importance. And for him to come to Jesus probably would have been viewed by most people as kind of an act of degradation or at least an act of humility. So he's humbling himself before Jesus. And why did he come? He comes out of a sense of desperation to cry out for help for his dying child. And his child wasn't just ill, wasn't just sick. His child was terminally ill. According to verse 47, it says he was at this child, his son was at the point of death. And he wanted Jesus to come down to Capernaum and heal this child. And Jesus kind of rebukes when he says, you know, except you see miracles. At least it sounds like a rebuke. He says, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman says, I don't think the nobleman really was maybe concerned about seeing signs and wonders in this passage. He was concerned about one miracle He was concerned about his child who was sick and dying, and he wanted to see that child heal. He didn't want that child to die. So I don't know that he was really concerned about signs and miracles, but I think it was probably a message to all of those around as well that except they see signs and miracles, they wouldn't believe. And you notice also in verse 49, he calls Jesus sir, which the same word in other places is translated as Lord. So he's calling Jesus Lord. 
he's acting in deference to Jesus. And he sees the only way out of the problem that he was facing is that Jesus needed to make this trip to Capernaum and heal his child. And Jesus basically says to him, I don't need to go anywhere. Your child lives. He's doing fine. And it's interesting to me that this nobleman, so many that were around, that doubted Jesus and acted in unbelief toward Jesus, as we saw what John said in chapter 1, he came unto his own and his own believed him not. And this man says in verse 50, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. So based on the word, the nobleman believes and turns around, starts for home. And at that very moment, back in Capernaum, he's over in Canaan of Galilee. He meets up with Jesus. Come down to Capernaum and heal my child. And Jesus says, go home. Your child's well. Your child's doing fine. So that man turns and starts headed home. At the moment Jesus says that back in Capernaum, that child sits up in bed, gets up. He's fine. He's out playing. They say, well, we need someone to go back up to Canaan and tell our nobleman, our master, our lord of our house, that he doesn't need to find Jesus. He needs to come back. So some servants start heading down the road from Capernaum to Canaan, Cana, and the nobleman is now, he's turned and left. He's going to go home because he believes the word of Jesus, and he's headed back to Capernaum. So one of the things that I see in this passage here is... I see the man coming from Canaan carrying, if you will, faith in the word of Jesus. Because Jesus says, go back to Canaan, your son's fine, and he believes the word. He carries the faith, and he's on the other end is coming the servants from Galilee, and they're carrying the news that, hey, the son's up in play, and he's just doing fine. And I would imagine... I don't know who's traveling faster. I don't know if the servants are running or the man is running. In my mind, I think they're probably both running or traveling at a high rate of speed. And they're trying to get, they're trying to get, he's trying to get home to see his son because he believes the word of Jesus. And the servants are trying to get to the master to tell him, give him the news, his son's well. And somewhere along the way, probably in the middle, they meet. And I like to think of them as them crashing together. And what happens when This man in his faith, believing the word of Jesus, and them with the news of this son being made well come together. Look what it says in verse 51. We'll start there. Well, let's start in verse 50. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him, And told him, saying, Thy son lives. Then inquired he of the hour which he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he himself believed. And then it says, And his whole House And this was probably no small house. This is a nobleman. He has servants in his care as well as his whole family. And his whole house believes. So again, I see that same pattern that we saw when Jesus turned the water into wine. Jesus manifests his glory. The miracle takes place. Jesus manifests his glory and it leads to people believing. They get a glimpse into the glory of Jesus Christ and who he is in his glory through that miracle, and they believe. And that's what happened at the, at the wedding feast, and that's what happens here with the nobleman's son. A miracle, manifested glory, people believe it. It's a manifestation and a proclamation of the glory of Jesus Christ. You may remember last week and even the week before, I made reference to the illustration of the difference between a telescope and a microscope. The difference again, a microscope takes things that are really small and makes them appear as if they're big. 
And a telescope looks out to things that are really big and brings them maybe a little closer, in appearance to a little closer to us, that we might get a glimpse a little bit of how big they are. When we think of the glory and looking at the glory of Jesus Christ, it's us looking through a telescope. That's what happened in the miracle of the water to wine. That's what happened to the miracle of the nobleman's son being healed. When Jesus manifested his glory, it's as if those people were getting a chance to peer into the telescope so that they might get a glimpse of how great and awesome and glorious Jesus really is. And they really were only getting a glimpse of it. They were really only getting it through maybe a telescope that isn't, obviously isn't presenting the actual size because we could say they're using a telescope. Before I go to the passage that I think really gives us a view into that telescope in Colossians, I thought I'd give you a few examples of what man does. That's not what man does in reference to himself. Man looks at himself through a microscope. Because man is small and insignificant insignificant compared to the greatness of who Jesus is. And therefore, he has to make what is small look a whole lot bigger. The first example actually isn't a man, it's Satan. Satan is still trying to manifest his glory or to display his greatness. Remember, Satan is the God, little g, of this world. So he does that in this world. Jesus came in, as John says in John chapter 1, as light into darkness to manifest the greatness of his glory. He's coming in to where Satan is constantly trying to manifest his insignificant, fleeting glory. Listen to this prophecy about Satan from Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, this is Lucifer, Satan, thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is Satan looking at himself, if you will, through a microscope, trying to make himself appear bigger than he really is. And then the last verse of that passage says this, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Your insignificance, your powerlessness, your weakness will be on full display for everyone to see when you are in comparison to the Lord God Almighty, to the King of kings and the Lord of Lord, lords. We have another example of a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, in his lifetime, was probably the le- well, he was the leader of the world superpower called Babylon. He was the superpower. He was the big man on campus, if you will. And Nebuchadnezzar one day comes out of his palace and he looks about his whole kingdom and he says this. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. This is Daniel chapter 4, verse 29. He walks in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon and the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for for the house of my kingdom and the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Nebuchadnezzar was proclaiming his glory. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will. So when... Nebuchadnezzar got done looking through his little microscope at his little kingdom, at his little life, at his little power. God, a voice comes from heaven and says, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to show you that you are nothing 
you're nothing. And by the way, that voice came from heaven and said that to Nebuchadnezzar. When Jesus was baptized and come up out of the water, a voice came from heaven too. But it didn't proclaim the littleness of Jesus, no. It said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Sinful man does this too. And Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, let me read verses 19 through 33. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. And this verse says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 30, 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Lifted themselves up, started looking at themselves through that microscope of their own glory, in their own mind. They began to appear bigger than they really were. And God says, professing yourselves to be wide, wise, you became fools. And Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 3, which we looked at over a year ago probably, speaks of man's sinfulness in the sight of a holy and righteous God. In contrast to that, what John does in the book of John is proclaims the glory of Jesus Christ and says, here it is. He says, this is my thesis. The word, Jesus, the Son, was with God from the beginning. He was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he gave us glimpses through the telescope into his glory. In fact, this is how the book of John ends. This is John chapter 21, verse 25. The last verse of the book of John says this. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, and the which, if they were written, every one, in a book, I suppose that the world could not contain the books that should be written. So the manifestation of his glory is just endless. It's endless. And that's John's conclusion. Now, and I know... I'm just really going to go to this sort of as my conclusion. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1 with me. So Jesus came on the scene and turned water into wine. Who is this Jesus? How unbelievable is that? Jesus comes on the scene and from a distance heals this nobleman's son. Who is this Jesus? He's giving them a glimpse into his glory throughout the book of John and through the Gospels. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? Well, John proclaimed it at the beginning of the book of John. And then he gives this supporting material of who Jesus is and that he died for your sins and my sins, and he was buried, and he rose again from the dead. He ascended up into the Father. He's been exalted. Who is this Jesus? Well, I think the Apostle Paul proclaims it loud and clear in Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit or meet to, the part, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. How did he do that? Who delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is this Jesus? He's our redeemer. He's our savior. We have, we've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into this kingdom and you don't have a kingdom without a king, amen? Amen. Who is this Jesus? Look at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven 
and that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And as I mentioned on Wednesday nights, that that verse is sending a message about authority. Who's the authority? Who's in charge? Satan is the god of this world. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of all superpowers. Or this king, or this president, or this world leader. All things were created by him. And all things were created before him. And look at verse 17. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. By Jesus all things are held together. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, right now, Satan's the god of this world. There are people that are actually part of Satan's kingdom, or there are people that are actually part of Christ's kingdom. Which one of those kingdoms is going to go on for eternity? The kingdom of Jesus Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him all things might have the preeminence. He's preeminent. Verse 19, and I'll stop with this verse. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. It said earlier that he, uh, in him is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Christ. I had a couple of passages I wanted to read in amongst these things, but I'm, I'm going to read one of them. Why don't you turn to it, and we'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 1. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners. That means in all different times in past and different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's another way of saying maybe the Old Testament, right? God spake to the fathers in the Old Testament. Well, what's he done in these last days? In these last days, that's from the time of Christ and Definitely now, in these last days, has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. You see that there again? So Jesus isn't just this rabbi that comes on the scene and, and does a trick, turns water into wine, performs a healing, teaches a teaching. And everyone says, wow, what would Jesus do? I want to be a follower of Jesus. What can Jesus give me? If you listened last night to Chip Ingram. And Jesus becomes, as I like what Chip Ingram says to some people, Jesus is the cosmic vending machine. What can Jesus give me? No, Jesus isn't. Jesus is the one who made the world's. By Jesus all things consist. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That is who Jesus is. I brought this out recently, and I'll close with this, and I think it was in a Sunday school class. But when they were at the cross, in and around the trial, yelling out, crucify him, crucify him, spitting on him, mocking him, ignoring him, shaming him. And then when the crucifixion was over, the Bible says that a centurion looked up and said, Truly, this was a righteous man. One of the other Gospels records him as saying, 
truly this was the son of God. And then it tells us that the people left smiting their breasts. And I think what happened there is they realized at that point that they had been participating in the conviction and the execution or murder of an innocent man. And they felt guilty about it. And they walked away. Now that centurion even went further than that. As he said, this is, this is a righteous man. This is the son of God. And they leave. Then sometime later, about 40 some days later, Peter comes on the scene in the power of the Holy Spirit. He preaches Jesus Christ and he closes his message and he says this to them. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that was the manifested glory of Jesus right there. He is Lord. He is Christ. And there was an awakening in the eyes and hearts of those men and women that stood there. And they said, what should we do? We crucified the Lord of glory. What should we do? And many of them, 3,000 it says at that moment, received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Ignore that. There's nothing we can do about it right now. <laughs> That's my time buzzer there, I think, because it's 12.08. Let's pray. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in hearts today, and I pray that through this message this morning that folks would see who Jesus is today. That they would see that he is the Lord of glory, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God, I pray that you'd work in hearts. Maybe there's someone here that's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. They just thought of him as another religious figure. They just thought of him as another teacher of competing teachers. God, I pray that folks this morning, if there's someone here like that, that would see Jesus Christ as Lord who God sent here as a man to die on the cross for their sins, that they might be able to trust in him and have eternal life and be translated into the kingdom of your son. I pray that us as Christians here, Lord, that we would see Jesus as well, who he is. Lord, that he would truly be the Lord of our lives in every area. Lord, we would recognize that you are majesty on high. God, thankful for it. Lord, pray that these things would come to our hearts and minds and, Lord, in truth, and you would be glorified through it. We love you and praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Pastor Ron Kenny, and I want to thank you for joining us for this broadcast of Fellowship Baptist Church. We are located on 41 North Bedford Road in the Urbandale section of Battle Creek. The times of our services are Sunday school at 10 a.m., Sunday morning worship service at 11 a.m., and Sunday evening services at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evening services at 7 p.m. We have a potluck supper on every fourth Sunday with no evening service on that particular Sunday. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and you're always welcome at Fellowship Baptist Church. Your voice, your community.